Welcome uh, to Pod Crush. <laughs> oh, did we get something in sync there? Was there like a little harmony? There might have been. I think so, yeah. Yeah, Sing okay. Song-y. We'll never be sure. <laughs> Guys, today's guest is Taylor Momsen. And when she came in the room, she, you know, we asked her when was the last time you and Penn saw each other. And she said that it was when Penn, uh, she said it was when we filmed that uncomfortable wedding finale scene between you and Blake. And <laughs> I was like, whoa, she said it. But then I was wondering, Penn, she I don't said know if you're willing to talk said. about this. <laughs> she said what she said. Uh, what was it like to film a wedding scene with an ex? Was that weird? Um, I'm still processing it. No, no, you know, it's funny. I don't really know. I don't really know what in terms of it being awkward. I mean, like, I don't, I sure don't think it was awkward for anybody. Like, I think, she, yeah, I mean, so I, from my memory, I'm, I'm pretty sure we were exes for nearly half of the entire run of the series. You know, that's wow. it's like it was it lasted for nearly six years. And I don't think we were together mm. longer than two, something like that. Um so yeah, I mean, we went through. You know, it was it was it was actually we always were very professional. We always we had to do all kinds of nutso s- stuff. Mm, <laughs> like yeah. you know, like by like the time getting, we got to the wedding scene, you're like, a, cool. This yeah, is great. having a having a fake marriage wedding. And there was there was like I don't even think <laughs> in my memory there was not one bit of strangeness. You know, I mean, it was okay. like it was, yeah, it wasn't even yeah. a thing again because like you know everything in that show was about relationships like of some form and so mm-hmm. i feel yeah. like all of us had been in every configuration uh yes. imaginable that's true you, you know what ev- i mean every like, person on the show yeah. and so and so literally the idea that there was just this sort of and if you know a lot the 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 the, the finale in a lot of ways felt a little bit to, to to me like after such a long time it felt it was almost an afterthought you know it was like mm. It was yeah. like revealed that I'm Gossip Girl and and Dan and Serena get married. <laughs> and then and, you um, knew it was all over. And, and what are those? What are the other? Uh, Chuck and Blair. They, didn't they get married? They, they, but no, not they, in the finale. Yeah. They got married before right. the finale. They got married before, yeah. and then they had like a kid. There was a reveal yeah. there. And, but actually, Taylor came back. That was a, a pretty significant uh, thing that Jenny came why, back for the finale. Now I'm remembering. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's why it was significant for her because she yeah. had left the show. Yes. Yeah, see, I'm not even like. That's probably what she meant when she said that awkward yeah, wedding scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's probably true because she She's came back, back and she was like, oh, this is left. happening. Yeah. Pro- maybe yeah, even the yeah. last time she was on set, we might have been together. So, so that, yeah, that, that's that true. So be... for her, she's like these poor, poor Penn and Blake <laughs> having to soldier through. She had just like dug yeah. her head into the sand to I mean, hear anything that happened between you. Uh, that yeah. happened to you. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's a funny thought. They must be still together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let's okay. get to it. I mean, our, I think at this point our guest needs no introduction, very little. But for those who don't know, Taylor Momsen, our guest today. Uh, she is yeah. the lead singer of uh, the band The Pretty Reckless. They have the most number one singles of any female-led band on the rock charts, which is pretty huge. Amazing. Um, they've been going for half of Taylor's life. Taylor is a tried and true musician. That is what she does and who she is. However, you also may know her. Um pretty similarly iconic uh, as Jenny Humphrey in uh, Gossip Girl. I played Dan Humphrey, her brother. That's how we know each other. That's how we got her on the show. Uh, <laughs> she also was in, you know, a little movie directed by Ron Howard and starring Jim Carrey called The Grinch Who Stole Christmas and she played Cindy Lou Who. You know, it's a, another icon from your childhood. Incredible. But uh, uh, you probably forgot about that one because the other two are so big. We've got Taylor Momsen. Stick around. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we could have been your middle school besties. Fighting over whether we're team Backstreet or in sync. Taylor, how long has it been since you saw Penn? We were just trying to figure that out. I think it's been at least 10 years. Wow. I think, wow. I think the, it was probably the Gossip Girl finale. It was probably the last time we saw wow, each other. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I, I felt like a fangirl. Like it was like exciting <laughs> to see you guys together again. And I oh, didn't yeah. even know that I would feel that way, but I really did. I was like, oh my God. Aww. Yeah, it was really sweet. That's so awesome. I'm excited we're doing this. Yeah. Throwback. Yeah. Big actually, brother. I wa- sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that, that's surreal. I mean, so sweet. I watched a little TikTok that you posted this last Thanksgiving where we're all, you know, the, epic iconic um never ending holiday scenes where everybody's around a table and eating yes and um first of all it's rare that i see gossip girl clips anyway apart from maybe a meme you know sure. <laughs> but that was i don't know it really took me back it really took me back it feels like a different i mean couldn't be 
couldn't be further away. Like 10 lifetimes ago yeah. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you got into acting when you were essentially a baby, like two and three years old, right? Yep. But by the time you were six, you were, uh, you were, you were already, I mean, you were starring in like this iconic movie with an iconic actor playing an iconic role. Um, I mean, what was that like? <laughs> Like, like, you know, I mean, like, there's a lo there's levels to it. There is. There's and for people who it. don't know, maybe you can just say like what the movie is. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna share that. We're not gonna we're share, not gonna it. share <laughs> if you don't know. An iconic movie with an iconic <laughs> actor with an iconic <laughs> that comes around it was, every <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> um, it was uh, it was interesting. I mean, hold on, we do have to say it. It's the okay, Grinch. Yeah. Nava was not. That's how the Grinch stole Christmas with Jim Carrey, directed by Ron Howard. I played little Cindy Lou Who. Um, hmm. And it was honestly, it was great. I mean, it's it's all you probably know this because you started so young, but it's weird to think back on your life and as a kid in films and stuff and try to remember what you were actually remember and what you remember because mm. you've seen it. Oh, completely. So yeah. my memories are a little blurred, I think, yeah. from that experience. But the thing that I remember the most about it, like the thing that kind of I took with me from that, was that was my first time in a recording studio was mm. during The Grinch, because I little Cindy Lou Who sings a oh, song in the movie. that's very interesting. I really like that. Where Are You Christmas? And so it was my first time in a recording studio with the amazing James Horner. It was the first time I ever wow. put headphones on and heard myself through a microphone. Wow. Um, yeah. And it was my first, essentially my first music video <laughs> when yeah. I was five. Right. Um, yeah. And so, and that moment was really, as crazy as it might sound, even though I was so young, it was really... Uh, important to me like it was a I remembered it I fell in love with it yeah. and it was where I started to I was already kind of writing songs even though I was so young wow. and that's wow. where I went oh I want to make music like I want to make records and wow. this is this experience is awesome and there's actually some really great photos like side by sides of me sitting at the console with James Horner with my head down and my arms on the console <laughs> already, and then there's a photo a critic of, there's a photo of me like a you know i don't know eight years ago or whatever sitting there with our producer kato in the exact same position like wow. not posed or anything yeah, yeah, and yeah. fans put wow. those side by side and i just thought that was quite quite telling of you know yeah. yeah you you as much as you grow up you still are who you are as a kid <laughs> where were you living at the time hmm. uh i was living well i was born in st louis so that's where my family and i grew up um and still had a house there, but we moved into the Oak Woods in Los Angeles when we actually shot oh. the shot the film. I for, I don't know if I ever knew that, but you know, I lived very close to the Oak Woods when I was like hmm. twelve to twenty. Yeah, it's a, it's a scene. Oh yeah, the Oak Woods. Yeah. Do you have any memories of Jim Carrey? I like mean, what it was like to a work ton. with him. He was first of all he was so nice. That's that's what I remember. Aww. He was very very nice, very um, methodical, very hmm. like. I didn't quite understand what an artist was at mm. that age, but if I had any inkling of what it was, it was that guy. Um, just yeah. the way he carried himself and the way he full on just went into that character was intense and insane. And I mean, yeah. like the way, like what he did with that with the Grinch was was and ridiculous. He's, I mean, he's kind um, of insane in everything. He really he, is. Yeah, like he really yeah. just embodies what he's doing. Um, but super nice. I remember he tried to. He loved a candy bar called. The Crunchy from Canada. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> I don't know why that's funny. But I don't, <laughs> well, it's going somewhere. And so for and I had never heard of this candy bar. And he would have them on set and he was always wanted another one, wanted another one, and they ran out of them. And uh for his for a wrap present, I was like, I'm gonna get him a giant box of crunchies. This is mm. gonna be my present to Jim Carrey. But I couldn't remember the name of the candy bar. And so I had to ask like <laughs> over and over and over what the name of this candy bar was. So I think he knew it was coming, but it was <laughs> <laughs> but that was my that was my rap present to Jim Carrey it was a ton of crunchies. That's very sweet. Aww, that's so cute. Taylor, I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot. Yeah. I, I heard you say in an interview that you collect dolls from all around the world. And I was wondering when did that start and is there a doll that you connect the most with your childhood that somehow is like emblematic of that? That's a good question. Um I did collect dolls. Did being the key word, because now I've, <laughs> when you've toured the world multiple times, right, it's that collection mm -hmm. got way too large for my tiny little New York apartment. Mm. Um, <laughs> they're now all in storage. Um, okay. But uh, no, it was a cool little... I, I, it started when I, on my very first tour, I wanted to uh, like pick up something in every city I went to. I just thought that would be cool. And I started with uh, key cards to hotels. 
And then that mm. slowly or very quickly realized that that was a bad idea and that you would have an endless amount of key cards to hotels I mean, right, on tour. And they all kind of look the, same, kinda look the same. I was yeah. thinking I could make some yeah. kind of collage or yeah. do something cool with them. So that yeah. quickly pivoted to dolls um, just because they have personality. I think they all have like, you know, a, a little Chinese doll from China has this character mm, yeah. to it that is is very memorable of where we were. And so um, so that lasted for about a year, I would say. Maybe a little less okay. until it just got. And you already and you kind of covered the world more or less. Yes. With it, wow. Yeah. So you were like really. No, I got Amsterdam. Touring. I've got China. I've got Japan. I've got Australia. I've got England, Paris, um, Spain. Uh, wow. Where Brazil? Uh, there's I've got one from everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Can I? How old were you at that point when you had were touring like that much? Um. Well, we started. Our first real tour was when I was 16. We went on Warp Tour for the summer. Um, and then shortly after I left the show, after I left Gossip Girl, we were just kind of on tour nonstop. So 17 on, mm. um, 18 on. Like going to hell, the record cycle was we toured for about two and a half years straight. Whoa. Um, so that was that's a long intense. one. But that's, you know, that's how, that's that's how it goes. That's yeah. typical. Um, and it's great. Wow. It's the best job in the world. It is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when yeah, I mean the little taste I had of it, and just I mean I just know that when you love it and when you're doing it with people you love, like, it's an incredible gift. It's an incredible gift. It really is. I, I, people mm. always ask like, the, you know, oh, it must be that's such a hard job, and it's like, well, like how do you play every night? I'm mean, like, no, playing is great. Playing mm -hmm. is the best job mm. in the world. Like that's never a job. That's what I look forward mm. to. The travel. Yeah, that's the lack of sleep. The sound checks. Not, uh, well, no, I love sound checks. Sound checks are my favorite fair, yeah, part of the cool. entire. <laughs> I would sound check really? forever um, if I could. That's my favorite part. Because sound check is getting to play and jam and be mm -hmm. ultimately free with great sound mm -hmm. without yeah, the pressure that's, of a that's show. A, yeah, right. That's So sound check's my favorite part of the day. I like that perspective. <laughs> Another brilliant reframing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear a little bit about what you were like at sort of 12, 13, like that middle school age. If we would have met you then, how would you have described yourself to us? Uh, shy. I was very shy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I, I, that definitely. Not that it no, has that to you check remember. out with me, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's true. I was very shy. Um, still kind of am, which is most people don't expect that, I guess. Um, I was always very introverted, and then my extroverted self was mm, taught, I guess. I kind of taught myself how to mm. be an extrovert. Mm. Um, but I'm most comfortable when I'm, like, alone in my apartment <laughs> with the guitar. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm socially very awkward. Uh, so, yeah, shy. And um, I moved around a lot when I was young, so I never was in kind of one school for too long. Um, so I had making friends and that kind of thing was always a bit of a challenge for me. So I was very introverted, I guess, introverted and, mm -hmm. and kind of shy. Mm. Mm. Who did you admire? Like, did, was there anyone that you sort of felt like you wanted to be like them artistically or that inspired you? Um, well, when I was nine, I believe I was nine, um, my dad took me to see the White Stripes. And that oh, was a wow. pinnacle changing moment for me where I was I grew up listening to my dad was awesome because I grew up listening to his rock record collection and like every Saturday when I was at home when I wasn't filming or working um every Saturday or Sunday he would have like rock history lesson essentially where we'd go to the basement and he would play me pick a vinyl whether it's Bob Dylan or Joni Mitchell or the Stones or the mm. Beatles or uh David Bowie was the mainstay in the house, uh, whoever it was, and play the record from front to back and explain to me why this was great. Mm. <laughs> and then he would take that and make mixtapes out of it, and that's kind of where I got my musical knowledge. Um, and he then took that and translated it into live shows for me, and the White Stripes was the first, like, real rock show I had seen. And he took me right into the mm. pit, uh, full-on mosh pit, everything, and <laughs> it blew my mind. Like, I just sat there in awe that two people could make that much noise. And yeah. Mm. And so it was like there's a couple turning points in my life that I think have really impacted to where I am, impacted me to get me to where I am now. And that was recording studio when I was five and with the Grinch and then seeing the White Stripes when I was like nine because it was it went from I want to make records to I want to play live. And that was mm. kind of where I got the bug for that. So I admired great artists. And, and then my musical taste kind of just grew from there as the Beatles and 
the White Stripes mm-hmm. and Bob Dylan and The Who and Pink Floyd. Mm-hmm. And then when I got into like early teens, I discovered the 90s. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Soundgarden was the first band that I really fell in love with there. And that kind of changed my whole world as Soundgarden. I want to ask just because you, you told us that story about your dad. Yeah. Tell us about your family life. What was that like? What was your family into? How were those relationships? Um, my family. I mean, uh, it was different. My mom and I, my mom, my sister and I traveled a lot um, because I started working mm-hmm. so young. So my dad would stay, he had a full-time job and so he would stay home and work and my mom and my sister and I would go wherever we needed to go um a lot in the beginning a lot of that was Los Angeles and New York obviously um like when I was three probably starting two three four before the Grinch uh so yeah two three four (laughs) we would spend summers in New York um so I actually spent a lot of my childhood in New York and fell in love with Manhattan at a very early age because Mm -hmm. I'd come up to do auditions for commercials and things in the summer months um and then moved to California for a little bit when we did the Grinch and then moved back to St. Louis and then moved to Texas for a while and but not permanently like my my father always had the house and so that was the home wasn't that in Maryland it was St. Louis until I was about 10 and then we moved to Maryland uh because my dad switched jobs I went to school properly for about a year in Maryland and Mm. then got uprooted for Gospel moved to New York. Okay, so that year of schooling was like right before. It was right before all that. Yeah. Okay. So Which like right was before middle school. Right. Be- and it was during middle school. Okay. Like so, um, your first year. So yeah, like sixth, seventh grade. Uh, which was interesting because that was probably the first time in a long time that I had been in a proper school system. Yeah. And Sounds like almost kind of ever because you yeah. were so young before. Yeah, I was so young before and was never there for full years like I would mm-hmm. I would go to a school for a couple months and then leave to go work and then come back and you know making friends was always challenging for me because I was first mm-hmm. of all the Grinch if you want to go back to the Grinch the Grinch changed my life in a multitude of ways one of them being I was made fun of relentlessly <sighs> so every time mm-hmm. I would start a new school or go somewhere else I don't even think the kids knew my name I was just Grinch girl uh, <laughs> and so it's Grinch girl Grinch girl Grinch not girl. even Cindy Lou who oh no not even the character name just Grinch girl and so that was uh Wow. That was just a. I mean, I got used to it. But it was, it was alienating. That's, that's, yeah. And that's so, so when it's I, it's like so cruel. It's always out of jealousy, I think, in those circumstances. But it's so cruel. It's like hard to be on the receiving end <laughs> no, of that. No, you no, no. It's because those young children are very confidently, <laughs> very confident in who they are, and they're just <laughs> seeing reality. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You know. I'm just saying that, like, even I mean, I the, was Grinch the girl, issue, but, yeah. you know, yeah. it's also Taylor. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so that was that was always. Fun, the fun, fun times. But when mm. I got to middle school, uh, that was the, kind of the first year. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was a, a good full year where I was in school and I had the opportunity to try to kind of actually make friends. And it's, I put a band together. It was my first band, my wow. middle school band, okay. garage band. Um, we never could settle on a name, but we would jam after school, and that was always fun. And were you and singing then, then, or were you playing I stuff too? I singing, forget. playing guitar, okay. writing. Um and then so as soon as that kind of – I've kind of started to find my little groove in school as a normal kid, Gossip Girl came about, and I got uprooted to New York, and then band fell apart. You know, we were going to be huge. <laughs> it's a real bummer. Uh, <laughs> and had to kind of restart it all again in New York, um, right. which didn't take me that long. Do you know, I mean, in the end, yeah. even though Gossip Girl might seem to others or probably even to yourself like this – major moment i mean the truth is it sounds like you you really only took like three or four years off quote unquote yeah music well it took a i mean and not even off yeah not off but i was recording and writing and stuff but uh just not to put out um to the world and it took it took a minute to find the right band members you know because it it wasn't something where I wanted to just audition people and hire a band. Like I really, I think part of because part of the reason was because I I traveled so much as a kid and like I was saying I had a hard time making friends and I really wanted to make my own kind of makeshift family. Like I wanted to be in a band. Mm. I wanted to be a part of something, mm. um, and not do it by myself. Like I wanted to be the Beatles. I didn't want to be Elvis. Like who wants to do this alone? Mm. Right. I wanted to share it with people, and so it took a while to find the right the right guys. But it came about really organically and. Now it's we're going, about to go make our fifth record, and we're still we're still doing it. That's so amazing. it worked out. Mm. It seems like you were like you said you could fi- had f- 
kind of found your groove. You had started a band in middle school. You were in school. You, it was your first opportunity to really make friends with your peers. And then you got Gossip Girl. Was there any part of you when you got it that felt like, actually, I don't want to do this. Oh, I, yeah. I want to stay. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was. So what, what ended up happening? Um, <laughs> well, I don't know how much I should share on this show. <laughs> um, okay. I was I was. I was convinced of it. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, uh, you know, larger powers than me came down and went, yeah. this is a great God. opportunity. God came down and went, this is a great opportunity. <laughs> you got to do it, kid. I really think this um, one might be a hit. <laughs> no, honestly, the big selling point to me for, for the show of, like, convincing me to move and wanting to leave school and everything was... Uh, a, you're not, it's New York, so you're not that far from your friends, so you'll get to mm. see them, yeah. which of course was not true. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see them ever again. But uh, there was a, wow. this, that aspect, but it was also New York. I loved New totally. York. And so as you get to move to New yeah. York, and the show's very yeah. fashion-oriented, and it's it has a lot of things and a lot of elements of things that you're interested in as a real person. Right. Um, and you'll have a good time. And so mm -hmm. that that's, was that's that. That's actually... Was that. Surprisingly similar to mine, yeah. except minus the things that I thought I would be interested in. <laughs> <laughs> but New York was the, the Manhattan yeah, no, was no, it. Well, 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 thinking, th yeah, like seeing it as an opportunity and, um, and um, yeah, that's that just interesting to hear. And also, I think not knowing, I mean, you have to feel this too, not knowing what a phenomenon it was going to become. Like, it was just another, yeah. to me, especially at that age, it was just another job. Like, I always went and worked and then I would come home and then I'd go mm. and work and come home. And I'd never been on a television show properly before, where it was like a, a full time gig. Um, yeah, for I mean, so I don't think I realized how much of a commitment it was. So when they were like, mm. "You can come back and see your friends, right, and you can right, go to right. school sometimes, and you know, take your work with you and tutor on set, and then you'll come back," I didn't realize that that was a pipe dream. That was never going to happen. Yeah, I don't think. Um, <laughs> you know, what's funny here is that the pipe dream is that it wouldn't be that successful. Um, I just want to point that out. That's, and then, but it's, it's so interesting too because that is always the that is the strange like uh, what's the I guess a duality when yeah. you're when you're trying to make something as an artist, whether as an actor, maybe even as a musician. I think it's like the hope is, of course, always that it does very well because mm -hmm. technically speaking, that would say, oh, I guess I've made something. I'm a part of something that's done well, and it, that must mean it's good, and that I'm got something to offer. But then at the same time, you can't expect that to happen. Yeah. So you're thinking about how much you can just continue on with life as you know it. But then if it really does hit, it's going to change everything. Yeah. And I mean, you know, a lot of this show, it, it points different guests. We could, I, you know, there's an opportunity for me to reflect on that time and how unusual mine was. But I mean, yours was, we were, we were in the same world. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I definitely did not go through, you know, the, like that, that unique experience that you were going through. It's, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. different. Um, you know, and I also, I was, you know, kind of going to the, the awkward shy thing. Like, I I was so much younger than all of you. So much. Um, mm. And. You were 13, the, right? I was 12 in the pilot, 13 when Whew. the show started, yeah. 12 Were the you pilot? the youngest yeah. person on set or was the mm -hmm. Eric, were oh, you guys no. the same age? He's older than me. Oh. He was actually oh, great. Really when weird. I moved to New York, Connor, Connor and I became friends and he kind of took me under his wing because um, I was starting high school by the time the show That's was picked right, up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, like anyone, I wanted to go to an actual school to meet people and make friends. That didn't last very long. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but Connor was like, come to my school. I'll introduce you mm -hmm. to all my friends. He was a senior. I was a freshman. Um, and so I kind of fell into his his clique of friends for a minute there. But uh, ended up leaving that school and just homeschooling because it, mm -hmm. it was too yeah. difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but yeah, no, I think it was... It, Again, like not to keep going back to it, but that's where music became such a solace for me. Like it, 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 it thinking back on my life, it was this, it was this place that I, I could just be, I guess, like writing songs and and emoting how I felt because mm. I, I was, oh, by myself a lot. Like I never, I didn't have my own clique. Like I didn't fit in with you guys. I didn't fit in with Connor's friends. I was younger than them. I was the new girl. Mm. I was Grinch girl. Yeah, I was whatever. Like I was sounds... always kind of in this this weird isolated world, partially of my own creating, probably. But it's where music kind of became this solace for me, where I could, um, I don't know, find myself or express yeah. myself mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. feel good about myself. And well, you're you know. a musician. Yeah. I mean, I actually think like 
in a way, even though I already knew this about you, yeah. I think even hearing it is sort of like both with uh, perspective and time, but also just hearing it right from you and how you've been able to reflect on it. I mean, you, you just you just essentially have always been a musician and you never yeah. really stopped. And that's always been what drives you. And so I think this perception that anyone might have of the fact that you were like an actress turned musician is really not the case. Mm -hmm. No. It doesn't sound like that at all. No, it wasn't. <laughs> like, You're a musician like that, you was, it was, acting. It was yeah. a childhood thing that, you know, I got, yeah. I got put into. It's like two years old. I wasn't making my own choices then. And literally as soon as I got to an age where I... I could make my own decision. It was like a click. I don't know exactly what happened, but it's like I woke up one morning and went, wait a second. I don't have to do this. Mm. I don't have to mm. do this other job. I can I can just play in my band and I can tour and write songs. And I can, I don't, that's all, I, I can just do that. Granted, a little more complicated to get out of a television show than that, but but the yeah. answer was yes. Like you, you can just do that. I have the ability to create my life how I want to, create it and live my life how I want to live it. Mm -hmm. And that was a, I don't know exactly what made that click, but it, it did one moment and it was like a light bulb went off and I uprooted and changed my whole life kind of overnight. <laughs> but yeah. They went, well, we can't let you out of your deal, but we can write you out of the show so you can go on tour. Hmm. You can't mm -hmm. act in anything else. And I went, that's fine. That's not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I can't <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I can't, exactly. <laughs> um, they're like, but if you're not in the episode... If we don't write you in the episode, you're not in the episode. Right. And so that's they wow. they really allowed me to to follow my my dream. And that's beautiful. And so I'm forever grateful and thankful to them for that. Okay, I definitely want to talk about your your career as a musician, and it's it's obviously like it's your main thing. But I want to just ask a couple of gossip girl questions, if that's okay. Sure. I'll leave for um, these. You want you, you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the first question is for both of you. Uh, what's your first memory of each other on set, and what did you think of one another? Oh, that's a really good question. Do you even know? Uh, no, I don't. I, mean, I don't either. I feel like we've asked Penn this question like anytime the castmate <laughs> comes on, and he's always like, hmm, what was it? <laughs> well, well first, no, first, first memory. Yeah. It's not like I don't have memories or acknowledge well, sure, sure people. Memory. Sure, it's an just, early memory of Taylor and what you thought. Just, of. Yeah, Prove it, so, Penn. I mean, I just remember our scenes being really nice because there was an actual family vibe, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. really held up the, like, there's just, a, I mean, especially as a father now. Of, I mean, I have a which is crazy. Yeah, right. I have a fourteen year old. Congratulations, by the way. Fourteen year old and a two and a half year old, nearly three. And so, like, your presence brought what I maybe get now as a father a little bit, just like a, a degree of it, which is like when you bring in people, when you bring in children, it just does something very positive, I think, to a mm -hmm. space. And a lot of times in professions. People don't feel that way. They're like, ah, these kids, you know, it yeah. kind of, it's like, now nah, we can't speak the way we want to speak or we, everything is kind of dumbed down. But I, I feel kind of the opposite. It's like, it takes somebody who's really mature mm -hmm. to, to an honest, you know, to like, to be themselves around a younger person. And, and I don't know that I did that, but I'm just, I just, I think you did. Oh, I, thanks. I think you totally did. I mean, my memory of you is, I mean, but I don't have any bad memories of you, so that's good. Great. <laughs> so I don't have any bad memories of you. <laughs> that's that's good. Good. And we'll leave it at that. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I always had fun filming our scenes together, especially in the beginning. We worked a totally. lot. Like, we worked, we worked a, lot a lot together. together yeah, actually, but, but, you know, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm almost like, oh, by the end, we really didn't work together. No. At all. No. You our, were always doing crazy. storyline. I was off being a drug dealer <laughs> yeah. and whatever else they were Wait. writing in. <laughs> You were a drug dealer? I think so. I, I never don't. actually watched the show, and maybe fans yeah, are going to yell at me yeah. about this, but I'm pretty uh, sure they had me dealing drugs at one point. That sounds kind of familiar. Uh, wow. Sophie, can you corroborate this? I don't remember if you were a drug dealer. It, I There's something with drugs you sewn into a jacket. Been. Yes. Something. So you're yes. a mule. A mule. Yeah, drug exactly. mule. Yeah. You were a mule okay. for somebody else. You had a friend. Was it Cara Delevingne? Not Cara. Um, Willa Holland. Oh, that's right. Willa. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a friend who like, kind of used you. As a yeah. meal. Oh, Jenny Humphrey. <laughs> oh, you know. Yeah, she burned bright like a meteor. <laughs> you know, you bleach your hair, wear some dark eye makeup, suddenly you're yeah. a drug dealer. Uh. <laughs> Taylor, you're, I think we've actually kind of talked about this indirectly, but your character, Jenny Humphrey, went through a transformation that kind of mirrored... She, she became more and more like you. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to know, because that doesn't always happen, did you lobby for that? Why was that important to you? Sort of why did Jenny go through that transformation? 
<clears throat> and um, was it like you or was it more? I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm well, style wise, it definitely started to transition a little bit more to my own personal taste, um, which I think Eric Damon did that with a, a lot of the characters. Like he would infuse your own, your own kind of personality into the, the wardrobe a little bit. Definitely. I mean, maybe I think for the women, for the women, was, at yeah, least I don't the, know about was, the men. Yeah. I think like Blake certainly did a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Leighton had a hand in that, although Blair is so, I'm sure Leighton like yeah. doesn't ever want to wear a headband. <laughs> yeah, Leighton's never <laughs> I don't think anyone here wants to wear a headband yeah. ever again. <laughs> I don't know. My hair's getting pretty long. It's, you could pull it off. Uh, He's about to enter his headband era. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, I mean, the the style aspect. Of, I think part of it was just we want. I don't know if I have the timeline right, but I I cut and bleached my hair at some point and didn't exactly tell anyone. Um, oh yeah, and so a, that you got to tell everybody. Kind of yeah. For, for for those who don't know, it's yes. like you got to your your appearance is managed. It was uh we were on hiatus or whatever right. writers I don't know something. There yeah, was a, there was we a weren't filming strike. for a while, and I changed my hair, and so then we came when we came back. They're like, well, we got to write this in now. Mm -hmm. It was always weird for me being young and suddenly kind of overnight being tabloid famous yeah. um which is a different kind of famous uh, yeah, yeah, where suddenly they're out the paparazzi's outside your house and they're following you and they're following me taking my sister to school and like mm. just weird you know mm. it's was, it was weird mm. um and they would photograph me on set like as you as everyone on set because we film in the streets of new york as my character and put it in the tabloids as taylor momsen mm. right and say mm. taylor momsen's wearing this and taylor momsen's blah 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 and that started to really bug me because my identity was getting kind of taken over I guess yeah. in a way where like mm. people had this perception of me that wasn't me and so I became very like hyper aware of how I carried myself I guess and so when I as I started to get older I think Eric understood that and he so we started to go okay well we'll dress Jenny a little bit more like you we'll mm. still keep the headband because mm. that makes it Jenny but we'll add the fishnets and we'll darken the eye makeup and right. we'll make it a little bit more tailorized um, to kind of blend the two. Tailored. So, tailored. Mm -hmm. So to kind of blend the two. And uh, and I think it kept the character organic because as I was growing and changing, they wanted the character to kind of reflect that too. You know, because I think that's... Mm. Totally, yeah. I, always I was some. just thinking though that that might, that's kind of like murky water because if you're already feeling like you are sort, your identity is sort of being collapsed into this character that you're playing... And then they make the character more, like yeah. yeah, yeah it's, it was like, reflecting on it. It was murky, murky water. Um, at the time, mm. I was sitting there going, "Well, at least I don't hate this outfit." So, right. like that's that's as, as far as I was thinking. I was going, "Well, I would wear this." Yeah. Like, no, of course. And mm. I think when you're on television playing a character, it's so different from when you're playing a role in a film. Oh, 100%. because because your identities aren't collapsed in the same way and it doesn't mm. last as long and you aren't constantly photographed and confused for being this person because yeah. yeah even i mean i think all of us oh yeah we were always just sort of like struggling with that because we were all young and you were just extremely mm -hmm. young I mean, you oh were no like, but you guys you know, were all mid. early 20s what well i mean Ed i was 20 was... when we shot the pilot yeah and, you know um and yeah i mean we were all we were all struggling with like uh being mistaken for this person and and none of us i think had the maturity um mm. to be able to i don't know just not take it personally and to know that it technically yeah. doesn't have anything to do with you yeah so it's, it's just so much easier said than done yeah it's like in a relationship like yeah try not to get angry with your partner go ahead try. okay yeah good luck <laughs> good luck with that exactly <laughs> that's a good way to put it we have a couple of questions that we ask every guest that are middle school specific and you didn't go to so much of middle school, so you can kind of choose. I guess it's the age range for you, from 12 to 15. Can you tell us a little bit about your first love, first crush, and your first heartbreak, what you remember about that? Oh, gosh. Um, okay, well, <laughs> all right, I got one story. It's kind of it's kind of silly. When I was – oh, this actually involves you. When – you did a show before Gossip Girl. I don't remember the name of it. Bedford Diaries. Bedford Diaries. And you were at the upfronts. Yeah. I was also at the upfronts. For what? I was doing a show called Misconceptions. Huh. And this was middle school. So probably, I was probably 11. Okay. And so we met, strangely, Whoa. very briefly mm -hmm. at okay. that thing. But who also was there was uh, I had a huge crush. Like my first childhood crush was on Jared Padalecki. 
from oh, yeah from Supernatural from Supernatural and Gilmore Girls, which I was obsessed with. I at forgot the time. he was a part of that. Yeah. And yeah. he was there, and he was on the red carpet, and I was so excited. I had never been so starstruck Aww. in my life. <laughs> and I went up, and I was like, he's going to fall in love with me. Like, <laughs> I'm in love with him. How can he not fall in love with me? And I went up to That's him and said hi, and he was so tall, and I had to look Aww. way up. You're and, quite tall. And I'm quite tall. Now, I was tall then, too, but he yeah, was, he people, was yeah. really tall. And he didn't love me back. Uh, he was nice, <laughs> but he didn't love me back. So that was my first love, my first heartbreak, all in one fell swoop. Uh, I then decided from that moment forward that I was only going to wear heels all the time. Really? Because um, if, so if I had only been taller, Jared would have loved me. Right. Um, <laughs> and, then to, and then weirdly to full circle that whole thing, then years later on Supernatural, which I love that show, uh, our song "Make Me Want to Die" is actually played in the show, and I was like, "Well, wow. maybe he'll, maybe he'll love me now. Right. Maybe he'll love me now." <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. There's first love, first heartbreak. Eleven years old. That's, That's really Jared Padalecki. Oh, wow. The other question we ask everyone is an embarrassing story, like any kind of any, anything you remember. Like it could have been on set, could have been. When you were in middle school, like a moment that... Other than being shot down by Jared Padalecki. Other, other, yeah. than, other than that was embarrassing. Other than that, um, okay. You want embarrassing. You want to get, get real with it. Here's embarrassing. <laughs> I'm going a little above the age bracket. I'm 16. That's fine. Mm. But 16, I'm on Warp Tour. It's our first tour. And we're playing a show, and it's great. And I'm wearing a little dress, you know, as I did. And one of the photographers decides to get down on his knees wow. and oh, shoot no. up my dress. No. And yeah, and I happened to be on my period at the time. Oh no! Oh, and no. my tampon string was hanging out of my underwear. Oh, and this was. And this was plastered on the internet. Oh no! On the That's... homepage of Perez Hilton, it went what? viral no. before viral I mean, was why a I thing. No, it's clearly oh, yeah. true. And you want to talk about embarrassing? That's not even embarrassing. Taylor that's... Momsen's tampon string. That, that... that's that's that awful. just feels like it, sh that that just feels... it should be illegal. Yeah, that yeah. should be. Illegal. That was yeah. that was embarrassing. So there's wow, there's one Taylor. for the books. Yeah. Taylor, I feel and like also you're how a, I feel humiliating like you're a... for the guy who did it. What? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I feel like you're a Horrible. war veteran almost. No, well, yeah. Tori, Tori <laughs> like, does that to you. There's, a, there's something to, um, I mean, I don't know, just like, again, because I can relate to so much of what you're saying, but I did not mm. go through it at the That's same really age hard. as you. And I just, and in that sense, like, man, good on you. You're, I don't know. You're, you the know. good news is nothing really phases me now, so. Right. You know, I prepared me yeah. well. I grew up really fast, I yeah. think. Which is great for ways. everybody. Yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's great for everyone. <laughs> Taylor, let's let's talk about the pretty reckless. Tell us about the name. It's such a great name. What inspired <laughs> yeah. it? When you found your band members, how did you know they were the ones? Like, talk us through that whole. Process. Okay. Um, well, the name. Um, originally, it was supposed to be the Reckless, which just sounded cool, and I wanted a the name because of the Beatles, um, mm -hmm. and I liked the Reckless. But we had some trademarking issues, so we were told to add a word. It would be temporary. I thought pretty sounded better than moderately reckless. <laughs> yeah. um, little did I know, you know, 15 years later, we'd still be the pretty reckless. So it's, yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. Um, you know, band names are just band names. They, it's the music that makes them. So Wait, it so is, Taylor, really so is. pretty is for like, is as an amount. I've always thought of it as like beautiful. Oh, well, that like works aesthetic. too. It's, you know what? It's however you want to take it. Pretty reckless. Like we're pretty it's and we're reckless. Entendre. That's what I always thought the name was. Entendre. Well, I thought everyone would abbreviate it to the, to the reckless. Like, you know, let's oh, up, right, like let's up, let's up. Uh, yeah, right. The pretty yeah, reckless, yeah. the reckless. Instead, it got abbreviated to TPR. Right. And mm. so, or pretty reckless. Or pretty of the. reckless instead of the. Which I right. should have seen yeah. that coming. Yeah. It's but actually it is, it pretty obvious. But thank you. I mean, it's it is clever. a great name. Um, yeah. It's technically more clever than the Beatles because that. Did you know that the A in B, the, B, the it's B E A T yeah. like Beatles is yeah. in a beat like. Yes. You knew that. Yeah. Okay, so I I just found this out <laughs> along with Sean Hayes and a lot of other people online. Okay. Yeah, so the anyway, Beatles. They got that. the beat. I, well, and it, just, it was very disappointing very to him. It's well, it's, such a bad <laughs> it is it pun. is proof that the music is what makes the band yes, name. Yes, it is. Yeah. Because yeah, because yeah. if, if I true. first heard about that and knew that it was like wordplay, yeah. I would be like <laughs> <laughs> That lame. <laughs> and then there's some band names that are just awesome. Like Soundgarden is just an awesome name. That is a name. great name. Awesome yeah. name. Yeah. That just yeah. wins. Do you think Radiohead is it? Because I think it's a bad name that is made brilliant by the music. I don't hate the name Radiohead. But yeah, I like it. I've never actually really given it much thought. <laughs> Sophie. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> I, like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also think it's not bad. 
Why don't you like it? <laughs> no yeah, why don't you like it? No, it's not that I don't like it. It's that I think it. I think it, with a different kind of music, it would sound really corny. Well, sure. Like Radiohead. It just. I don't know. It's... Well, any band with bad music, any band name suddenly becomes really yes. bad. And so that's, that's, Taylor, what of... do you think of the band name Mother? <laughs> Mother. <laughs> with it's an so X. bad. Well, it's it's an e. As long as it's... there's an X in it, yeah, then right. it's all right. <laughs> no, I mean, guys, trust me. I, I apply it to myself. And we, once we named ourselves, I was like, this is a terrible idea. First of all, this it's hard to name idea. a band, especially now so because bad. everyone has a name now with so the internet, hard. too. So to try yeah. to find something that's actually trademarkable is yeah. nearly yeah. impossible. That's why we had to put that friggin X in there. Now you've got bands that have full sentences as their band name. Right. Because it's like and, no just, con- and no vowels. And no vowels. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's the name. Um, okay. Taylor, you're, is it true that you're Wait, wait, hold, reckless? not to interrupt you. Now I want to know where Mother came from. How'd you guys get Mother? Oh, yeah. uh, I don't, re- okay, so it really felt like, I mean, at the time I was, I was, um, uh, undergoing a spiritual transformation. Okay. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And I just felt like mother had the most implications of any word I could think of. All right. You know, for everybody, for me, I was having a personal reconciliation with my own mother. I feel like at the time my relationship to spirituality was that of like closest to the earth and all that it represents. You know, mother is like a thing that births yeah. as, a, as, mm-hmm. a, and as a being that births. I think... Oh, no, it's not true. No, I hadn't met my now wife, who was already a mother, because my, my 14-year-old is my stepson. Okay. Um, but then once I met her and our relationship really started, I thought, oh, that's also interesting that I'm in a band called Mother, and it's it's even happening here. Yeah. For um, what it's worth, then, so you I, didn't think do, about I it love at all. the name Mother. <laughs> it's definitely not deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name Mother. It's the X that is very, it's like, it's it puts off-putting. it in a time. No, it just puts it in <laughs> it makes it a hipster capsule. Band. Yeah, it, it, yeah. No, it makes it a hipster band from about when it was. What was it, 2014 yeah, exactly. or something? It's just like right? every, yeah. yeah. I know, trust me, I really didn't want to have to do it, but we, <laughs> but we had to do it. Try and it also has the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has the capital letters, which again, like, and we, we, we really tried. We really, yeah. So, you know, anyway. Enough about me and my mother. I like it. Taylor, you were going to tell us about how you picked your band members, and then I think Sophie had a question. Okay, how I picked the band. Um, When I was 14, let's just go 13, 14, I was living in New York. I was writing songs. Um, I was working with different producers, um, trying to make my songs um, in my free time. <laughs> and uh, nothing was really clicking. Uh, to, this is kind of a long story, so to make the long story short, met a lot of people, finally met this guy named Cato, um, Cato Kondwala. And he came with this guy named Ben, who was a guitar player in a band at the time. Um, and the three of us met, and we just immediately hit it off in this kind of, I've known you my whole life, one of those kismet, mm. otherworldly ways where we just immediately bonded about music. We bonded about life. We had the same way of thinking. We had the same goals. We had the same, I don't know, everything. Um, the same kind of mentality. Uh, and Ben was in a band with Mark and Jamie at the time. And uh, I heard their band and I essentially went, well, that. Mm. <laughs> like that's mm. That sh- you should be my band like we should be in a band together mm. and they went no way and I went well you haven't heard my stuff yet mm-hmm. and I played them some songs and and basically that that's the very long story short we started working together and we started playing together and it just worked and it just gelled and that's kind of how it all yeah. formed it's hard to find partners in anything in life you know like mm. a, and especially I think musical partners creative partners is incredibly challenging because you have to there's so many things that have to align to have that work and and have that be a a lifelong relationship, you know. Um, so true. And and I just feel very fortunate that that I found that. Like it's it, it was such a shot in the dark and so random and and completely lucky and uh, mm. and it just fucking worked. Oh, sorry, I don't know mm. if we I can. I can uh, that's fine, totally fine. Okay. Um, w- yeah. And now you've been together for half your life. Is that right? Half my life. Yeah. Started the band when I was fourteen. Wow. Um, wow. Made the first record when I was 15, came out when I was 16, on tour at 16 cents, and wow. Wow. now I'm turning 30, yeah. That's quite rare for a band to stay together for so long. Mm-hmm. And 
like my husband's in a band. They've been in a band for eight years, and they've nearly broken up at least once. <laughs> Um, I wonder what tips you have that, that you've garnered over the years about creative collaboration. I mean, I think it comes back to we all have the same goal. Like, we all want to be great, and we want to mm. be better than we were before. Like, we're always trying to to push ourselves to be better than the last time. Um, ben and I writing together, we just have a... It, a flow or a, a thing that just it, it just works and it's incredibly I, I keep saying lucky because it just is it's incredibly lucky mm -hmm. like it's a to find a, a musical partner like that where it just um not everything you do is great but you know when it's not and you know when it is and that I think that mm -hmm. that I don't know, and we just all like each other. Yeah. I think that at the well, end of the day, like right. the, that's you know, I think we all we all like making music together. We all like playing together, and we all like hanging out. And I think that that's yeah. mm -hmm. there's your magic formula. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> we're never sick of each other. So you're saying it's magic? Mm -hmm. It's magic. <laughs> it's that it's that, it's that yeah. magical musical magic thing. Did, yeah. did you guys ever go through like a, a particularly tough time though? You know, and I'm kind of curious what got you through it. Well, I mean. <clears throat> Not to completely shift gears here, but if you want to talk tough, I mean, um, recent 20, uh, not that long ago, uh, Cato, who produced all our albums, who's, you know, I met him and I met Ben at the same time. He died in a motorcycle accident very suddenly. Um, I'm so sorry. Thank you. And so that, that changed everything. Um, that yeah. was an incredibly hard time. It's changed my life in more ways than I can count. Um, took I don't want to go too far into it, but it took me very down. I fell into a very dark hole of depression and substance abuse and everything that comes mm -hmm. with death and loss and trauma and not being prepared or know how mm -hmm. to cope with it or deal with it. Um, I essentially quit everything. I essentially stopped mm -hmm. making music. I couldn't listen to music, everything bummed me out um for lack of a better term uh is is dark got very dark there for mm. a while um and i said this a lot it, it, in as cliche as it may sound it was music that pulled me out of that hole even though it took a while mm. to come around to it um like making music? making music okay. at, at, there was a point where i like i shut myself off from the world in this very dramatic way i didn't mm -hmm. talk to anyone i didn't want to see anyone i uh i, I fell apart and mm -hmm. i eventually turned to writing which is the place that i always anytime i felt down or anytime i felt anything that's where i could find my center is through writing and unbeknownst to me without any intention i just kind of let the floodgates open about what i was going through and wrote this record called death by rock and roll mm. and that was the that was the turning point where I went okay I we got I gotta make music like this is this is how I'm going to get through this this is how I'm going to honor his legacy this is how I'm going to keep his memory alive this is I'm gonna finish what we started um, and not mm. let this take me down entirely which it, it came very close to that um, I kind of I had to make a very conscious decision at some point where I was either gonna die or I was gonna try to move forward and I chose to move forward and I think that you know obviously I think that was a that was a good decision that's a, um, <laughs> a good decision yeah. but uh but yeah that was a tough time in the band because it was it, it wasn't like a you know we're fighting so we're gonna break up type mm. thing it was Cato was essentially the fifth member of the band he just didn't tour with us so it was mm -hmm. like our band just died like what do we do mm -hmm. um my best friend is gone my partner is gone like you know he was he filled so many roles in my life and he was in a blink of an eye no longer here and it that was that was incredibly incredibly challenging and I think it's and it still is honestly like yeah. we're it's it's not really been that long it has not been that long and uh, wounds like that I'm I'm discovering don't ever really heal uh mm. they just kind of transform themselves a little bit over time like they turn into they turn into these scars like they're a part of they're a part of you that yeah. it, that's never going away and it's it's 
it's I, I always say it's kind of like I'm no longer bleeding all over the floor with it. Like it's not mm-hmm. this open wound, but it is still a scab and a scar. And if you pick at it too much, then yeah, it's mm-hmm. a risky little game. This the, the symbology of death, the metaphor, the poetic and literary usage of death. I mean, you know, so many artists, countless artists, most artists use it. Yeah. But you know, there is this like I don't know preponderance in in your music there and and so i'm kind of curious about two things and you can kind of take it wherever you want is what thinking of like the deepest kind of most spiritual impulse there in the music you know what what has been your perspective on death and how did how did this change that you know that's a good question um when expressing myself through through songs it's it allows me to go to the places that aren't necessarily comfortable for everyone that aren't necessarily comfortable for me and i think that that when you push yourself to to do that when nothing's off the table i think that's the biggest thing i i don't put any limitations or i like i'm not going to sing about this i'm not going to write about this i think when you are literally an open book and you're writing that's when you're going to come up with the best stuff that's what you that because it's it's going to have an honesty to it that isn't just honest for the sake of honest like i'm telling you what i did today or blah 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 but like it it actually is saying something that's deeper and bigger than me Mm -hmm. and i think that that's always the goal and so you know death obviously is a reoccurring theme in a lot of ways because i write about life and death is a huge part of life and um you know, I wrote about it from my fears of death to my perspective of death up until up until this, you know, this recent record where it then turned into a new angle on it where the song and the, the title of the record is Death by Rock and Roll, which that like this is kind of an example. This that song came about because that was a line that Cato had said years ago. It was kind of this phrase and this motto that we all lived our life by and and it wasn't negative. It was yeah, yeah. you know, death by rock and roll, like I'm gonna live life mm-hmm. my own way, I'm gonna go out my own way, fuck anyone who doesn't get you, like rock and roll till I die. And so when he passed, that phrase just resonated with me in this whole new way and I I couldn't get it out of my head. And I was like, okay, well that's that was the start of of the album. I was like, okay, I'm going to I'm going to honor him in music with with his ideals and his ideas which were both my I also my ideals and my ideas and and finish this kind of thing that we started when I was 14 years old <laughs> like and not let it die yeah. with him. Yeah. And I think that that was that was a really big struggle, but the the song itself like it's it's so an homage to him. It opens the first thing you hear on the album is his footsteps. I had a recording of his oh, footsteps wow. walking across the studio and so like you mm. you put on the record. If you turn it up real loud, you can hear him breathing. It's very Aww. haunting. And mm. so then getting to go and tour the album, which when you make a record, it's its own world. And you release a record, it's its own world. And then touring the record, it kind of transcends and turns into almost something different. But getting to go on stage every night and walk on stage to Cato's footsteps was just this very powerful moment. You know, it, it mm. took something that was incredibly sad and devastating and almost killed me and turned it into I tried to turn it into my power Mm. of like he's Mm. here with me every night and he's no longer here but we're still doing this together and it's uh, that was something that was really important to me there's no way around the hard things in life and I think that Mm. the only way to live life to the fullest is to accept that and and you know and to to live through them and um try to understand them as best you can. And I think that, and the way I understand things and the way I process things is through song. Um, And so that's how I try to do it, I guess. I don't know if that, I don't know if that answered your question, but. I just have to say you're terribly impressive. Like you're, you're like a person of substance. I think more. (laughs) Thank you. More than a lot of people that I've met. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That she worked with. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. More than anyone in this room. Wait a second. More than (laughs) at least one out of the two people she works with. I, I like, like the name Radiohead. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a nice name. I like it. It's nice. It's good. It's cute. <laughs> well, our final question. On the eve of your 30th birthday, yes. 
Let's go back to when you were 12. What, what, uh, if you could go back and say anything or do anything, what would you, what would you say to 12 year old Taylor? Follow your gut. That's mm. what I'd say. Like, she doesn't need to hear that she did that. I know. We need, uh... but like, I would just, I would just reassure myself that that's the right mm. thing. Yeah, that's like, of course. Because I, I don't, I don't really believe in. I don't know what the right word is not not mistakes, but I don't believe in like trying to change the past or you know like everything I did got me to where I am now. Everything I went through mm -hmm. got me to who I am now, and I think that that's important. So I don't I never think about life and wish I could go back and redo something. A lot of times we ha we have people reflecting, being like, it's like yeah, it's not about changing, but it's like ah, that was such a rough time, and I went through so much after that. Like I wish I could just kind of <laughs> say this, but what you just said is like I mean you kind of did that. Yeah. You really did do that. Yeah, no, I did. So I did do that. You're just just an encouraging I did that. pat on the back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I would just tell myself like you're doing the right thing. Like it's it, it's mm. gonna be hard. It's gonna be a lot of struggle. You're gonna have to fight for everything to the nail that you want in life. But you know that's life. Mm. And you're gonna have some experiences that are gonna crush you, and you're gonna have experiences that are gonna be beyond your wildest dreams that you can't even imagine yet. So just mm. keep going, man. That's great. Oh, that's how I see Love it. Love that, Taylor. Love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, so nice thank to you. meet I mean, you. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank, thank you. you this coming. was super yeah. fun. Thank you for having me. It's so good to see you, honestly. I know. Like, uh, yeah. this is, it's kind of blowing my mind a little bit. So. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. It feels like I haven't seen you in ages, which we haven't, that's but also true. I feel like I saw you yesterday. So, I know there's moments when you, there's moments when you like laugh or just, and I'm like, yeah, that's, Same, you. that's so crazy. I'm like, gosh, no. that's shit. so crazy. Same I feel person. 12 all over again. Big brother's here. That's very sweet. What were you writing songs about at five and six? Do you remember? Oh, you know, uh, moving around the ocean, uh, traveling, not having friends, uh, my inner, you know, demons as a five-year-old, yeah. you know, the, the usual. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet.